So who are the two witnesses? One popular theory says they are Enoch and Elijah. I, on the other hand, along with a lot of other folks, favor Moses and Elijah. So who is right? Stay tuned if you want to have six clear reasons why I believe that Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses. Hi there, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Sooth Keep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth. And you know, folks, good things happen when believers are excited about God's revealed truth. And the revealed truth that we're going to look at today is the identification of the two witnesses. Now, the point itself is a, is a small point. It doesn't significantly affect any fundamental doctrine, and you're not going to seriously undermine dispensationalism or the pre-tribulation rapture if you have a different opinion on this than I do, or if you have an obscure opinion on this position, or if you believe that Enoch and Elijah are the two witnesses. But this small point carries an outsized gain. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's because this small point is an ideal proving ground for the point behind the point. And that point is the hermeneutical method. Now, don't get thrown by the big word. Hermeneutics is just a big word that's a theological way to say the science and method of Bible interpretation. A right approach to the interpretation of the scriptures is critical. It is the bedrock for the biblical Christian. It's the bedrock for the fundamental doctrines of the faith. It's the bedrock for Christianity. So we want to be literal in our approach to the scriptures, but we also want to be broad in our examination because the Bible is its own best commentary. So what methods should we use for resolving difficult questions and biblical conundrums? Do we embrace the common method of taking one or two proof texts with the official interpretation or with a popular interpretation? Are we going to do a deep dive into the scriptures and get a broad range of information and a broad range of arguments from the Bible and let that massive amount of information give us the mind of God from the Bible. Now, the question of the two witnesses is a classic example that illustrates this uh, battle between the two methodologies, the battle between the proof text methodology and having a robust amount of argument and information from the Bible. Because on the one side we have a single proof text with an official interpretation and on the other side we have a half dozen strong arguments. But there's something else that makes this a good proving ground for, for, for presenting the proper approach to interpreting the scriptures and that is that this is not a hot potato issue. We don't have a lot of Christians that are so married to their understanding of this verse um, or, the, or this subject that they're not going to relinquish their views no matter how much good arguments you bring to them and no matter how strong your arguments you bring to them. Uh, and most Christians are going to be teachable enough on this matter that your, a good presentation is not going to be a wasted effort. It's not going to be lost on them. So let's start by taking up the argument for Enoch and Elijah. And essentially there's just one argument. And that argument is Hebrews 9.27 where we read, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Now the argument says, uh, the argument basically is going to point to this verse and say, Listen, th this here tells us that all men must die. And then they point out that, Enoch and Elijah are the only two people that never died. And therefore they conclude, well, Enoch and Elijah have to come back 
and they have to die. And that means they have to be the two witnesses. But folks, this frame of argument is it's a mistake. Because this verse does not teach the necessity of all believers dying. It teaches that no man gets a second chance after death. That's all it teaches. I want you to notice, and we already all know this, but maybe we're not putting it together with this passage. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes to rapture his church, all the living believers are going to go up without dying. They will never experience death. They will never taste death. But if you are going to be consistent with your belief that this verse, Hebrews 9.27, teaches that every human being has to die, then you are going to have to believe that the Lord is going to take up all the church up in the rapture, and then he's going to drop them. And they're going to fall a quarter mile or a half mile, and they're going to splat on the ground. And then he's going to resurrect them, because, you know, they all had to die before they can go up in the rapture. Uh, no, folks, it's not going to happen that way. Those that go up in the rapture will never die. And Hebrews 9.27 is not teaching that they have to die. It's not teaching that any man has to die. All it's saying is that you only get one chance. You have to get saved, and if you die before you get saved, you don't get a second chance. Now, these folks try and strengthen their Enoch and Elijah argument by pointing out that this passage limits men to dying once. It's given unto man once to die. And then they point out that uh, Moses, who some people think is one of the two witnesses, has already died. So if he comes back and he dies again, now he dies twice. And this passage says you get to die once. So therefore, they claim Moses can't be one of the two witnesses. But this too is a mistake, folks, because this passage doesn't require one death, in contrast to two. All it says is that um, once you die, you don't get a second chance. Now, I want you to notice something. How many times did Lazarus die? Ah, oh, that's right, he died twice, didn't he? He died, was raised again, and then later on he died. Folks, every believer in the Old Testament or in the New Testament that was raised from the dead by one of the prophets or by the Lord Jesus Christ, every last one of them died two times. So if they can die two times, guess what? Moses can die two times. So... Folks, Hebrews 9.27 does not teach you can only die one time, you can't die twice. And it does not teach that you have to die. All it teaches is that you only get one shot at salvation, and once you die, your chance is over. It says nothing about the righteous being able to be raised from the dead and die a second time. It's happened numerous times. There is another argument now in the Bible against Enoch being one of the two witnesses. And we find that in Hebrews 11.5, where we read that the purpose of Enoch's rapture was that he should not see death. He's not going to taste death. He appears to be an intentional picture or an intentional typology of those who are going to be alive here on earth at the time of the rapture. Folks, those who go up at the time of the rapture are never going to die. They're never going to taste death. Now, if Enoch is a picture of those who are going to go up in the rapture alive and stay alive and never die, then it would be very incongruous for him to come back down here and die. That would mar the picture that there's no death in the rapture. That would mar the not dying aspect of the rapture. And I do want you to notice that according to Revelation chapter 11, verses 7 through 12, both 
of the witnesses die. Now, since Enoch is a type of those who are going to go up in the rapture and never die, and since both witnesses die, doesn't it stand to reason that Enoch can't be one of those two witnesses? Because if he's one of those two witnesses and he dies, then you mar the typology of the rapture that people are going to go up and never die. Folks, God takes his typologies seriously. Moses lost the opportunity to go into the promised land because he smote the rock twice when he was supposed to smite it one time. He marred the typology of Christ dying once. And folks, rest assured that Enoch is not going to die in the future because God is not going to allow the typology of the rapture to be marred. Well, let's move on to the six strong arguments that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. Let's start with the first one, which is the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and the three apostles, James, Peter, and John. We see this in Matthew 17. We see it in uh, Mark 9 and in Luke chapter 9. And this passage has a far-reaching significance that many people appear to overlook. Notice that the preceding verse, which in Matthew is chapter 16, verse 28, says, Assuredly, I say unto you, there are some standing right here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Mark says, until they see the kingdom of God with power. And Luke says, until they see the kingdom of God. So what we see here is the Lord gives three of his disciples a foretaste of the second coming, when the Lord is going to manifest his glory and establish his kingdom. And this foretaste of the kingdom, this foretaste of the second coming glory, is why the Lord said, some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So in conclusion, on this point, if Moses and Elijah appeared at the foretaste or the typology of the second coming, they shall also, isn't it likely, isn't it most likely that they're also going to appear and be present at the second coming itself? Now, the second argument is of Israel's strong connection with the law and the prophets. You can't separate the nation of Israel, not the people or the nation, from the law and the prophets. If you say the one, you imply the other. If you say the law and the prophets, you imply Israel. If you say Israel, you imply the law and the prophets. Now, Israel was under the law and the prophets during the entire 69th week, right through John the Baptist and right up to Christ's triumphant entry. Now, the new covenant in Christ was offered to the nation of Israel through the ministry of Christ. But the nation rejected it. There were many individuals that believed it, a, a, a good-sized remnant. And they were later added to the church. But now when we come to the 70th week, Israel is going to be under the law and the prophets again. And once again, the new covenant is going to be offered to the nation of Israel through the prophets and through the representative of the law, in my mind, Moses. And this time, one third of the nation is going to embrace this. And these people, who Jews who accept this message, they are going to be the nation that is born in a day at the second coming. Now, who best represents the law and the prophets? I mean, if you had the law and the prophets during the 69th week and you had it all the Old Testament, and then you come to the 70th week and you have the law and the prophets again, who best represents the law and the prophets? Well, Moses is synonymous with the law. He gave Israel the law. And this is confirmed in Luke 16, 29, where we read, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. 
In other words, Moses and the prophets equals the law and the prophets. They're synonymous phrases. On top of that, Elijah is the representative of the prophets. He's probably the most famous and illustrious of the Old Testament prophets. And, and he is specifically named as the forerunner of Christ. So what better choice for the two witnesses is there than to have the representative of the law and the representative of the prophets? Moses represents the law, and Elijah represents the prophets. Now, the third argument is the typological forerunner argument. Moses handed the baton to Joshua, who's the type of Christ, a few days prior to Joshua taking Israel into the promised land. And likewise, it would be fitting for Moses in the last days to hand the baton to Christ just a few days before Jesus Christ at the second coming takes Israel into the promised land of the kingdom. And also in this way, we have John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Christ at his first coming. And it would be very fitting if Elijah himself came to prepare the way in person for Jesus Christ in person at the second coming. Now, the fourth argument is the prominent names that are mentioned in connection with the 70th week. In Revelation 15, 3, we read, They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. And I suspect that this song that they're singing is not reflecting merely on stuff that happened thousands of years ago, but it's in connection with current works going on right there, real time, around them, in the land of Israel, in the 70th week, in the tribulation. And they're going to see wonderful works and wonderful miracles wrought in a powerful, miraculous testimony from heaven. Also in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, we read, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, let me point out something here. We saw Moses mentioned in association with the 70th week, and we saw Elijah mentioned in association with the 70th week. And may I point out that no other prophets are mentioned in relation to the 70th week in the Old Testament or the New Testament. And Enoch is not mentioned in association with the 70th week. Well, let's move on to the fifth argument. And that's the necessity of Jewish prophets. All of the prophets to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament time were Jewish, from the rise of Moses to the time of Elijah to the time of Malachi to the time of John the Baptist during the 69th week. And many of these prophets also had a ministry to the nations around them. Isaiah is a famous one for that. Now, the 70th week, is God's return to the people and nation of Israel. And this implies, doesn't it, a return to the Jewish prophets. And it would seem very much out of place. It would seem very inconsistent were God to send a Gentile prophet to the Jewish nation of Israel. Moreover, the two witnesses are intimately associated with the Jewish temple. We see this if we look at Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. So in Zechariah 4, 2 through 3, we see that the two olive trees stand on either side of the lampstand. They're associated with the oil that fills the bowl at the top of the lampstand and then goes down through seven pipes to the seven candles or to the seven lamps. And we also see in Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, that the two olive trees are the two witnesses. So did you catch that? 
The two olive trees are the two witnesses, and the two olive trees stand next to the lampstand in the holy place in the temple. This strengthens the argument immensely that the two witnesses have to be Jewish prophets. Because non-Jews were welcome in the outer court if they believed in the God of the Jews, but non-Jews were not allowed in the holy place. They weren't even allowed in the inner court. You had to be Jewish to be in the inner court. And these two prophets are associated with the lampstand in the holy place. Now, the last argument is the congruity of the miracles. Elijah shut the heavens for 42 months. We read this in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, in Luke chapter 4, verse 25, and in James chapter 5, verse 17. We also read in Revelation chapter 11, verse 6, that the two witnesses are going to shut the heavens. And there we read, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And when it comes to Moses, we know full well from the Old Testament uh, accounts that Moses had the power to turn the uh, Nile River to blood and to smite the earth with plagues. And we see the, that the two witnesses have the same power in the book of Revelation during the time of tribulation. They have the power to turn the water to blood and they have the power to smite the earth with plagues. This is also in Revelation 11 uh, verse 6. And there we read, These have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with plagues, all kinds of plagues, as often as they will. Folks, these things perfectly fit Elijah and Moses. They don't fit Enoch. So in conclusion, I think these six arguments make a very strong case that Moses and Elijah are going to be the two witnesses during the 70th week. And on top of that, I have presented a few arguments that seem to forbid Enoch from being con considered in the conversation on the identification of the two witnesses. The fact is, mixing Enoch and Elijah seems to be as out of place as mixing the church and Israel or mixing the rapture and the second coming. At any rate, whether I convinced you or not on the identity of the two witnesses, I want you to be encouraged because our time on earth is rapidly drawing to a close and the time of the two witnesses is rapidly racing upon this planet. It, the tribulation is soon going to dawn on this world and the crack of dawn is the rapture of the church. So folks, glorious times are coming if you're a believer and terrible times are coming if you're an unbeliever. Be ready. Eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. We'll see you next time.